again. But uh, <laughs> after the Battle of Waterloo is over, the war does not end. Napoleon has to flee because he's lost Paris. Um, Paris turns against him politically. So now he tries to flee to the uh, uh, Bay of Biscay, one of the ports of, the, I think, Rochefort, where he's going to board a br- uh, French frigate that's going to take him to America. Mm. And if he he was very close to succeeding, so close. The Prussian cavalry was on his heels. They were chasing him. Okay, welcome everyone to History Hour. I am so excited to have this guest on. Eddie from History Unlimited, if you are not following him on Instagram or TikTok, you got to get on his page. This guy is one of my favorite people to talk to. He really knows his stuff. He has uh, two pages, actually. He's got History Unlimited, which is so much fun. He is especially a uh, favorite of mine when it comes to military history. He posts a lot of that. He knows his stuff. And then he also has another page called the Vietnam War, point three, right? Yeah. So, <laughs> so as you can tell, he's, he's, he's doing it good if he's on the, <laughs> the third version of, of the Vietnam War yeah. on Instagram. Eddie, welcome so much to the show. Thank you. Uh, introduce you yourself uh sure. let it let my audience kind of know who you are what your background is where they can follow you um and okay. i'm really excited to get into some napoleon yes, Napoleonic definitely. wars with you today definitely okay well thank you lisa i appreciate you having me on your show again this is the second time it's been a long time coming um you had very kind words for me and thank you again um you are also one of my favorite creators and you inspire me a lot with your american history and I, you know, try to piggyback off some of that content to produce it um, in my own way. And um, we, you know, with, with me, I have a primary Instagram account, History Unlimited. There is a backup account, History Unlimited 2.0. Mm-hmm. But I'm really not working on that one so much. I just collab myself and try to gain some followers. But just in case Instagram gets really naughty with <laughs> us, uh, that's my backup plan. Uh, the Vietnam War 3.0. There's a reason why it's 3.0. I'm sure you guys <laughs> you know that. Um, mm-hmm. The nature of the content um, dictates uh, three times around so far. Um, it does get very <laughs> popular. It does have some pretty good videos on it. Uh, it is evolving. Um, I also have a TikTok account, also History Unlimited. That is my third TikTok account. My first two accounts, unfortunately, were banned. Uh, the first account I had uh, had over 150,000 followers on it. That was banned. Um, I started over again. And the reason why it was banned is because, uh, unfortunately, TikTok um, suppresses a lot of historical content and mm-hmm. the very controversial content you cannot share. Mm-hmm. So I can be found on TikTok. Uh, I upload many of my videos to TikTok, um, YouTube. I do not. I have a YouTube channel, but I, we, myself and Lisa were uh, talking about this before the show. Um, I am going to start working on my YouTube channel again, and I also have a Threads account, which I'll share this day in hitting uh, this. Excuse me, this day in history snippets um, of bigger videos that I do on History Unlimited. Um, personally, I, I am married with uh, two children. Um, I am a firefighter EMT volunteer. Um, I also uh, work as a, a firefighter, industrial firefighter, mm-hmm. and a, a petroleum plant for an oil company in New Jersey, yeah. where I live. Um, I'm only <laughs> five minutes away from New York City, right smack dab at the crossroads of the American Revolution. Oh, uh, I hope appreciate. To. So I everywhere hope to visit I go, one day. <laughs> everywhere I go, I can go five minutes north, five minutes east, southwest. I'll run into a, an American Revolutionary War monument. Washington's retreat route ran right past my house. So that's who I am. Oh and again, I appreciate you having me on. I'm excited to talk about my favorite historical figure of all time, Napoleon Bonaparte. And uh, take it away. <laughs> the last time we spot, talked, I think it was like almost a year ago. Yes. Yes. And you had mentioned what a fan of Napoleon you are. And yes. I, as a follower of yours, you know, I know that that, that is kind of one of your, you know, favorite historical yes. figures. The Napoleonic Wars is like one of your areas of history, favorite areas of history to mm-hmm. study. And with the new movie coming out, which I think a lot of the historical community history buffs are very excited about, I thought who would be the perfect person <laughs> to talk about Napoleon 
with, and I said, that has to be Eddie from History Thank Unlimited. <laughs> because the last time we spoke, we touched a little bit on yes. the Napoleonic Wars. Yes. And I could have talked to you for like another two hours. Oh, easily. Just listening to how you, just what you had to say. <laughs> because it was so fascinating. So Thank I you. really wanted to get you on. Now is the chance to talk about <laughs> Napoleon with okay. this new movie coming out. Yes. And I wanted to get your thoughts. What do you think of the new movie coming out? Uh, have, I'm sure you've watched the trailer. Yes. What are your thoughts on the trailer so far? Well, so far, I think they're releasing too many clips of the movie as trailers. They're up mm. to number four so far. And as what I could see on the trailers, they've done a really good job on the cosmetics, okay? The uniforms, the atmosphere is very true to history so far from what I can see. And the way Jacqueline Phoenix has been made up to look like Napoleon, um, he's he's excellent. Five really stars. good. Really good. <laughs> Not as good as, say, Marlon Brando, in my opinion. Okay, mm. but very, very on point. Mm -hmm. um, there's a couple of uh, parts of the premieres that I saw right away. And as a historian, you're like, wait a minute, that never happened. Okay, uh, so if you want me to tell you about that, I will. Um, but uh, it looks great. It really is going to be a great movie. And I think it's going to... Uh, cast a lot of good insight about Napoleon that and answer some questions that people might not be can, that might be confused about because Napoleon besides being the most written about person in world history with the exception of Jesus Christ and possibly the prophet Muhammad mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of misconception about him mm -hmm. about his life and his career and I believe the movie will do a lot to debunk some of those uh, rumors and falsities and everything else that we tend to believe as truth unless you talk to somebody or read a book yeah. you're like wait a minute that isn't true and one of the things i'll start out with with a trailer uh trailer clip is that napoleon and his artillery never fired on the great pyramid at giza okay yeah. <laughs> um that's in the trailer and I, I'm, I i've cringe. heard a lot, i've heard a lot of other historians be like yeah. whoa 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 yeah whoa, no 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 here. that so. never happened napoleon <laughs> Napoleon would never have allowed his artillerymen to practice on anything in Egypt, let alone the Great Period of Giza. Okay, so he was... I, I really want to get into that Egyptian campaign with you. But before we sure. get into that, I really kind of want to focus on, you know, Napoleon's beginnings. Like, mm -hmm. what was his childhood like? I know that he was born around the time that France acquires Corsica. Yeah where he was born and his family mm -hmm. were uh, kind of rebels. They, they were not yeah. rebels, but they were very, you know, Corsica yes. or Genovian mm -hmm. Genoese, I think is how mm -hmm. you pronounce it. Yes. Genoese. They were very much not in favor of uh, uh, the Island being captured by France. So right. let's, I, I kind of want to go over yeah. uh, how he grew up and what his life was like as a child. Okay. So France acquired, Corsica in 1768, a year before Napoleon was born. He was born mm -hmm. on August 15th of 1769. And his parents, uh, Carlo and Leticia, were minor nobility. Carlo was a lawyer, and he was one of 14 children. So Napoleon was not the runt of the litter, nor was he the oldest. He was the fourth. Mm -hmm. And um, Carlo spent a lot of time in France. Okay, he was actually... Um, in the court of uh, Louis XVI as a representative of Corsica. Okay. And Corsica uh, did not become a province of France officially until 1770, but it was still recognized as a territorial possession. Therefore, everyone on Corsica was born a Frenchman. And this is where the fate of history intervened. Had Napoleon been born before 1768, he would have not been able to attend the military university in Paris. He would have not been able to become an officer in the French Royal Army because you needed to be trained at that military academy and of minor nobility. And you mm -hmm. had to be French above all. Wow. So he would have been Genoese. Uh, by descent, of which his family is. That's a lot of, that's a big misconception also. People think Napoleon was French. He wasn't. He was Italian. Mm -hmm. um, he, you know, became a Frenchman later on. Uh, but his childhood, as you as you were asking me, he, he had a very uh, spotty childhood. He was known as really the problem child in his family, but not necessarily for a bad reason. Napoleon was was into a lot of playing war games and everything. He used to play play war games with his brothers. Uh, for example, his brother Louis, who actually became uh, king of the Netherlands and a general in Napoleon's army. 
he liked to play war games with his brother, and he always um, demonstrated leadership tendencies from the tender age of like five years old that uh, his mother, who had a very big influence on his life growing up, noticed with him. And wow. although his father, Carlo, was away most of the time, he recognized mm-hmm. that he wanted to uh, give his children the best education possible. So he made enough money for each and every one of his sons to go to uh, school uh, mm-hmm. abroad. Um, the Corsican move for, for independence that you mentioned was Pascal Pali. And Pascal Pali was a Corsican uh, rebel revolutionary. Mm-hmm. And he sought to uh, seek independence from first Genoa and then France. And the uh, Bonaparte family was allied with that faction. And yeah. Carlo recognizing that France was going to maintain control over Corsica, they sent a couple of thousand troops to maintain order there. Shortly after its acquisition, uh, Pauli was not going to succeed. So he went to France to try to garner a relationship between Corsica and, and the French government. Mm-hmm. Well, then the French Revolution happens, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and that all goes downhill. But Napoleon um, was sent to the military academy mm-hmm. uh, in Paris, and then he attended the Artillery Academy of Brienne. And Napoleon demonstrated, like I said, leadership qualities as a teenager. Um, he used to organize snowball fights, and he used to lead them. That's how he would, you know, demonstrate his tactical prowess. Um, He made many friends at uh, university and he became, you know, um, a a writer. He wrote a a romance novel, as a matter of fact. One of the things people don't know about Napoleon was he was a writer. And unlike somebody else who is compared to him unfairly in history, he wasn't a failed artisan. Okay, he was yeah. a, he was a successful writer for a cer- certain period of time. But Napoleon was a was a very good student in his classes. He'd be the equivalent of an honor student today. Mm-hmm. Um, he excelled most importantly in mathematics, which was a prerequisite for any good artillery officer. He yeah. loved history, loved literature, and even though Napoleon, uh, by his own admission, was tone deaf. Okay, he liked to sing and he was terrible at it, but he (laughs) loved classical music. He loved Mozart, for example, who was one of his favorite. Um, So he enjoyed the arts and um, he enjoyed the enlightenment, the enlightenment, which was going on in Europe at the time. And a big hero of his. A lot of people believe that Alexander the Great was Napoleon's favorite historical figure. It Mm -hmm. wasn't. It was Frederick the Great, who he absolutely admired. Yeah. And matter of fact, when he took Berlin in 1806, he went to the grave of Frederick the Great and told his generals that if that man had been here at, at this time, we would not be standing here today. So he had a lot of reverence for Frederick. Um, but uh, his childhood, like I said, for his teenage years, um, he was involved with um, a lot of girls. Uh, he was a, a guy, regular teenage guy. Yeah. Um, but he never really developed any type of relationships early on. He became much of a loner when he, you know, when the French Revolution broke out. Mm-hmm. And he found himself, you know, he was in charge of uh, a battery of artillery. He was a lieutenant. And he was asked to um, suppress a small group of revolutionaries and he like so many officers in the royal army said no and he kept his commission but he left france to go to corsica Mm -hmm. while he worked on um a history of corsica and he worked on uh his relationship with pascal Pali, who he had a falling out with later on because he realized that Pali was not in doing what was in the best interest of corsicans but in the best interest of himself right so does does um Pascal Pauli uh, in some way does he seek out kind of a mentorship from Pauli in any way? Yes, or? he does. Yes, he he kind of treats him like a celebrity. Okay, so he starts writing letters to him, and Pauli's like, "Who's this Napoleon guy?" You know, it's like yeah. somebody writing a letter to a baseball player or something. Like, who's this guy? Well, then it became more often to the point where he's like, "All right, this guy's becoming a nuisance. I got to meet him." So he actually got a chance to meet him, and unfortunately, uh, Polly didn't like Napoleon, and he thought he was a bit of a brat. So to, to, to use his own words in his, yeah. in his biography. So after that, they kind of had a falling out and Napoleon uh, left his cause, so to speak, and realized that the real opportunity for advancement was in France through the revolution. And so, so he, okay, so maybe, so just to kind of clear up. So the revolution starts in France. Yes. 
And he, as an enlightened thinker, is yeah. not in favor of the monarchy. No. So, but he's part of the French army. He is. So yeah. he decides that he's going to go to Corsica and fight a rebellion there. Yes, correct. Okay. Yeah. And then when he realizes that, you know, that's not going to happen. It, was, it wasn't worth it. <laughs> right. Then he goes back to France. France. Yes. And and where does he fit into that? It, the revolution is still going on? Yes. So what okay. happens is he uh, returns to France and he retains his commission. By that time in 1793, he gets his first taste of battle. And he was a captain at the time of artillery. So through the influence of a couple of generals who were uh, friends of his, um, he was put in command with the artillery at the siege of Toulon that the British were besieging in southern France. Mm -hmm. um, and he developed a strategy to defeat the British. And that's how he got his rank as a, a general because they promoted him the brigadier general um he was the youngest brigadier general promoted in the french army at that point oh. um in the new republic so he was above all an opportunist just like julius caesar okay he saw an opportunity with the upheaval and the chaos occurring in france and said you know what i believe in the ideals of the french revolution but i'm not a jacobin okay i'm not a royalist i'm kind of in between but mm. i'm gonna go with who appears to be winning all right. So Napoleon went with, quote unquote, the winning team. Mm -hmm. And through the influence of several politicians in the French government, he experienced a meteoric rise in the army. And his first command was the uh, general of artillery for the army of Italy. And yeah. eventually he became very soon after uh, the general of the army of Italy. So his early uh, career was heavily influenced by politicians who saw him as a great talent on the rise because of his ability shown at the siege of Toulon against the British, who he did not like, by the way, if anybody <laughs> could guess that. He hated the British uh, with, with every fiber of his body. He coined the phrase perfidious Albion. Yeah. So the, the nation of shopkeepers and the British did him dirty later on too, but we'll yeah. get to that. <laughs> but uh, that's how he started. And through his, his mentorship from different politicians, uh, one being Barras, who was uh, a very important politician in Republican France, um, he got control of the army of Italy and the army of Italy was in a very poor condition, mm -hmm. but being a master, uh, uh, being a master of, of logistics and being a master of administration, Napoleon built that army to what it became, a force of its own. And that's one of the most underrated things about Napoleon. Napoleon just, just wasn't a military genius. He just wasn't a soldier. Napoleon was an adept politician. He was great at politics. Yeah. Um, he was, like I said, a, a writer, a mathematician. He was a lot of things. He excelled in logistics and administration and care for the troops in his army, mm -hmm. they called him uh, the the corporal, uh, the little corporal, because he was he spent a lot of time with the rank and file. You yeah. know, he also believed in a meritocracy where if you perform, you were going to get rewarded, and that's how he promoted most of his officer corps from the first moments when he took command in the Army of Italy until his demise in 1815. Um, he was perhaps a little too rewarding because many generals and politicians took advantage of him. Mm. One of them being Talleyrand, okay, who was the uh, French minister. Uh, he took advantage of Napoleon all the time. Uh, yeah. Fouché, who was the chief of national police, uh, would always go behind Napoleon's back with his, his kindness and everything. So Napoleon had a very kind heart when it came to rewarding people. Mm -hmm. And it kind of contradicts this whole misconception about the Napoleon complex, okay? Napoleon could get angry. And he could fire off and really yell at people, but he would also reward them or apologize later on because he realized that he didn't want to make many enemies. He, he wanted to keep his, you know, enemies close and his friends close, but he, he didn't want to upset people because he realized he needed them. Um, they need, you know, he need, they needed, he needed political backing. Right. So he would utilize his politicians, but reward them with titles later on and also money when he was able to acquire it. So his marriage to Josephine, do you Very think that was as, as much of a political move as it was no. a social move? No. And I'll tell you, 
Uh, since we bring up his love life real quick, which is important <laughs> to understand with Napoleon because his love life and the failures in his love life really have a lot to do with his success and failure as Napoleon, as we know him. Um, Napoleon had an engagement before he married Josephine to Desiree mm -hmm. Clary. Okay. And Desiree Clary's story is interesting in itself, but he um, he broke it off with Desiree because he met Josephine. Mm -hmm. Josephine Buharanis was the uh, widow of General Buharanis, who was sent to the guillotine. He was a royalist officer. And Josephine herself was set to be guillotined during the reign of terror. Mm -hmm. And the reign of terror was stopped and right. she was released. And she met Napoleon through uh, Minister Barras. And Barras introduced the two of them. And Napoleon fell in love with her immediately. Yeah. To, to him, she was the shining example of what a woman should be. And she was an older woman who had children of her own, yeah. uh, Eugène and Hortense. And um, she didn't like him really at first. You know, she resisted his advances like this Napoleon guy, you know, and you'll see this in the movie. I've seen this. <laughs> this trailer part well they're they're going to show this in the movie and um she just didn't like him she didn't think he was very good looking she you know admired his charisma because napoleon above all was very charismatic mm -hmm. but it took her a while to warm up to him and like napoleon she too was an opportunist okay and as napoleon's popularity rose guess what else increased her interest in him yeah. To the point where they got married in 1796 when he became a very successful general in Italy against the Austrians. Mm -hmm. So she married out of an opportunity to Napoleon. And Napoleon, even though he divorced Josephine later on, it was not out of a lack of love for her. Napoleon right. loved Josephine to his dying day, and he would say that in his memoir. Um, he divorced her because he she couldn't produce an heir for him. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't so much that he was suffered from infertility or she, cause she had children of her own. Napoleon yeah, but, actually, but she had, she already had her t children were like teenagers by the time. Yes, got married. She was older. Yeah. So the, the consensus was she had uh, reached menopause and she could no longer have children by the time yeah. that they wanted to have children. She was in her late 40s. Right. Napoleon was still in his 30s. There was a, like, I think a 12 year difference between them. I'm not sure. Don't quote me on that. But she was an older woman. Mm -hmm. So the necessity to perpetuate the dynasty now when Napoleon became emperor was of first priority. And it didn't help that, his, that Napoleon's mother hated Josephine. <laughs> Because she said that she's from the West Indies, she's, you know, a, a West Indian witch and everything like that. So um, Napoleon later on uh, married the daughter of the Austrian emperor, Mary Teresa, and they had his son, Napoleon mm -hmm. II, who we'll get into later on. But Josephine, um, again, um, when they divorced, Josephine by that time was in love with Napoleon and she fell into deep depression. And uh, she acquired the estate at, at uh, Malmaison. Napoleon gave her a yearly stipend. Mm -hmm. And she died a very depressed and broken woman. Mm -hmm. It's sad the way she died. And it's sad because the two of them loved each other throughout the rest of their lives. They just couldn't practice that love because of politics. And, you yeah. Know. Well, I mean, I'm sure that, you know, when he was a general, the need for an heir wasn't as... No, no. As they had, but but no. let's talk about how Napoleon, he he's this brilliant general, brilliant, you know, tactician, strategist. He's making yes. these political moves. Yes. So how does he go from being a brilliant general to, okay, we are going to, now there's going to be the emperor Napoleon. How does that, right. how does that transition happen? It takes several years, okay? Yeah. And as Napoleon is, as Napoleon's transition takes place, so does the French Revolution, okay? Mm -hmm. The revolution changes numerous times. And a lot of people mistakenly say that, oh, Napoleon betrayed the revolution by coming first consul and then emperor. No, the revolution had been betrayed well before Napoleon. As a matter of fact, yeah. as far back as the reign of terror, okay? Um, it kind of so, went off the rails a couple It went off the rails there. very early. <laughs> yeah. Very early. And by the time Napoleon became a general in 1796, it went off the rails again. Mm -hmm. And you had this revolving door of ministers and heads of state and heads of political parties. So Napoleon, um, 
who was successful in Italy. The politicians in power recognized that he was successful and they were afraid of him because if he ever in got interested in politics, they knew he had not only the intelligence and the capability for it, but he had the backing of the French army. And that is a powerful force. So they said, you know what? Napoleon had some ideas. One of his ideas we're going to get into was the expedition to Egypt. So Napoleon said, you know what? In layman's terms, I got this great idea. Why don't we set an expedition to Egypt? I'll bring along about 20,000, you know, academics with me. They'll get a chance to explore the ruins of ancient Egypt. But at the same time, we're going to sever um, British commerce from India. We're going to threaten India directly. Mm -hmm. So Napoleon invades Egypt. He vanquishes the uh, Mamelukes, who were, who were you know, part of the Ottoman Empire um, at the Battle of the Pyramids, the Battle of Embaba, uh, which, by the way, was no nowhere near the pyramids. It was about nine miles away, even though in all the Where they did... I was going to say, where they did yeah. not fire on the pyramids. No, where they did not fire on the pyramids. His uh, men encamped on the Giza Plateau. So that part is true. The encampment was there outside of Cairo. Mm -hmm. But originally, Napoleon invaded Egypt to sever uh, trade communications uh, with India for Great Britain. So, and of course, as you know, the British didn't like this. Yeah. So the British were actively involved in aligning themselves with the Ottoman Sultan. And the t Napoleon suffered his first defeat in his career at the Siege of Acre in 1799. And the two men who defeated him, one of them was named Al Jazeer, and he actually was nicknamed the Butcher mm -hmm. because he was an assassin in the Sultan's, uh, Sultan's army. And the next man who was in charge was a uh, Royal Navy captain. Captain Sidney Smith. And the two of them had orchestrated a defense of Acre and re repulsed Napoleon, and he had to retire through Syria back through historic Palestine. And I say historic Palestine because Palestine has never been a nation state. It's been a historic region. That's an important historic region. Mm -hmm. So he marched through back to Egypt. And while he was in Egypt, he had a couple of problems. Yes. Right? So a lot of things were going on back in France. And he had just suffered his first defeat, his first major defeat here. And he was losing, uh, he was gaining popularity. I'm sorry. He was losing popularity in Egypt, but he was gaining popularity at home because the people at home wanted a military hero to surround himself with. And the person they were looking to was Napoleon. And like, you know what? He's not doing that great in Egypt, but he did great here on the continent. He is very familiar with the political system here. He doesn't like certain people. Well, we think that the current administration, in so many words, is shit. So let's invite Napoleon to come to Paris. So Napoleon leaves behind 5,000 of his men and one of his, his generals. Um, and he travels back through the British blockade, who tried to capture him numerous times. Yeah. Uh, uh, Lord Admiral Horatio Nelson was obsessed with trying to capture Napoleon, and he captured his uh, daily correspondence, his, his mail. And that's how Napoleon found out about Josephine's affair with Captain Hippolyte Charles. Uh, that was another story in itself, but that's what? one of the things. Yeah. So Napoleon went back to Paris, and before he even visited the ministers of Paris, he went to his wife. Josephine and confronted her about her affair that the British printed in all their newspapers and pretty much embarrassed him. Uh, and she admitted to it. She had an affair and she broke it off. And Napoleon the next day was like, okay, we're good. So he was <laughs> so infatuated by her that he would, he would, you know, she'd have an affair and be screwed around behind his back, but he's like, ah, no big deal. Uh, we'll no go on. So Napoleon was asked to suppress a rebellion in Paris uh, called the uh, 18th Brumaire on mm -hmm. November 9th um, of 1799, also nicknamed the Whiff of Grapeshot. So his brother Lucien, who would not really play a big part in Napoleon's life, Lucien was a politician who was very critical of the revolution of how it, uh, how it progressed. Mm -hmm. And Lucien turned around to Napoleon and say, Listen, you know, we need your help right now to save the Republic. And Napoleon was hesitant. He's like, you know what? I really don't want to fire upon civilians here. I said, but if you give me the cannons, I'll do it. So his friend, uh, who became later Marshal Murat, okay, captured some guns and brought them to Napoleon. And his brother Lucien convinced the, the soldiers there that, listen, he put a sword to his heart and said, listen, if this man was to betray the revolution, I would stab him right now as my own brother. Mm -hmm. And that moment, his the soldiers under Napoleon's command would have followed him to hell and back because they opened fire on the mob, dispersed them, and saved 
the revolution and save the republic. Where he went from there was up. Because yeah. he did that, he was now a hero. OK, um, there's so many different details to how he went from a general to second consul, the first consul. And how he did that was he seized power while the directory was trying to um, vote on who to put in power, the first, second and third consul of France. He took it upon himself in 1800 and said, you know what? No, I'm going to send my regiments into the equivalent of U.S. Congress. And he went in there with his troops and said, are you done voting yet? He's like, I'm going to decide to vote for you. I'm taking over as first consul of France. Is that now, um, now, is that the coup of 18 Brumaire? Yes, yes I it I is. I that right, Br yes. Brumaire. Brumaire. Yeah. That's yeah. part of the whole coup of 18th Brumaire, like the whiff of grape shot. That's all mixed into the same event. Yeah. So Napoleon took power and who could stop him? He had the, the, the you know, the, the loyalty to the entire French army who absolutely yeah. loved him. Um, so he took power as first consul. So after a while, um, Napoleon started to, you know, move into the palace of Versailles. He started to acquaint himself with the Bourbon monarchy mm. and he realized that, you know what? Um, why shouldn't he be a, a monarch like the other crown heads of Europe who got their position through birth? Remember, Napoleon was uh, meritorious. He believed that he earned that. So he's like, you know what? In so many words, I'm paraphrasing, of course. Um, I'm going to make myself emperor. So Napoleon decides he wants to become the crowned head, just like all the other crowned heads of Europe, to try to be on not hit the same level, but try to get their support and saying, hey, he's just another royal in Europe. Let's just treat him with the same respect and dignity. Well, that did not happen. OK, they didn't like that. They banded against him and formed the Third Coalition, which we'll get to in 1804. So they declared war on Napoleon, not France, but Napoleon. They honored Napoleon as a nation, and they were looking to turn to defeat him because they saw him as a usurper. Mm. And nobody was at the forefront more than George III's England, who yeah. financed all their money to defeat Napoleon for the entire length of his reign. As a matter yeah. of fact, the British government finally finished paying off their debts for the Napoleonic Wars in 2009. So we're talking about a lot, a lot of money. <laughs> so I want to, I want to talk. This. I want to talk a little bit about the Napoleonic Wars, but I do have a question. What happens to um, Napoleon's army in Egypt? Do they eventually just leave Egypt? When they surrendered. So what yeah. happened was the 5,000 men that were left in Egypt were left under the command of his personal friend, General Deza. Mm -hmm. um, it was also another General Kleber. Now, Kleber and Deza um, surrendered to the British, and the remainder of their men there surrendered as well. They were repatriated back to France. Oh, okay. okay. So they didn't spend any time in captivity or anything. They, yeah. as, well, as well as Kleber and Deza, who would play an important role at the Battle of Marengo, was brought back to France. Um, all of the antiquity that the French, now this is a very British thing, okay? Mm -hmm. All the antiquities that the French had excavated, the Rosetta Stone, Rosetta Stone all yeah. of the great stuff, right? Well, guess who took them? The British. <laughs> they, like they normally do, they took everything and said, yeah. we're bringing it back to England. And because of that, hardly anything made it back to Paris. Mm. So Napoleon's troops went back to France, but uh, the artifacts went to London. And many of them still exist there, still reside there today. Yeah. And that's a sore subject among the Egyptian government who wants that back. Yeah. And they're like, the British are like, oh, no. No, we're not changing the way we, we take things. We're going to keep it. And a lot of those artifacts are in the British Museum. <coughs> so, But his army yeah. was repatriated, yes. He didn't, I, he didn't lose them the, all. I have seen the Rosetta Stone. But I think that that is a big misconception about Napoleon. Yes. That he abandoned his army there. He, he didn't necessarily abandon it. A lot of that comes from British propaganda. Yeah. Where they said, oh, the newspaper said, oh, Bodhi abandons his army in Egypt because it didn't work out. No, he left Egypt for a political opportunity because yeah. he was he was asked to go to France. And the directory knew the army was gonna, still going to be in Egypt and knew the fate of the army. Mm -hmm. It was through the good good negotiating power of General Deza and Kleber that they were able to surrender with honor and not go into captivity. Because, again, the British, you know— <laughs> The, it's funny. We'll get to British propaganda later, but the <laughs> British totally did not like Boney. They called him Boney, okay? And they wanted to see him fail at every opportunity. So every chance they got, every correspondence that was, you know, from Josephine, 
their love letters, everything was in the British newspapers. Yeah. Napoleon was the original caricature in media history. No person was vilified more than Napoleon in British newspapers. Yeah. And British newspapers, guess what? They circulated around the world. The courts of Europe, in North America, in India. So everybody knew who Napoleon was, but they really didn't know who Napoleon was. Just the British version of Napoleon, which was so good that people still believe the lies today. Yeah. Well, you know, you know what they say? I... Propaganda is the oldest form of warfare. It really is. is. It really but, is. Um, but I really kind of want to get into the Napoleonic Wars sure. because um, I know that you and I, we've talked a little bit about the Napoleonic Wars and there were some really important um, things that came out of the Napoleonic Wars as as horrible as they were. But let's, um, let's talk about that. So okay. 1803. 1815 what kicks this off what kicks off the napoleonic wars in europe well what kicks it off is in 1802 the british and the french concluded the uh treaty of amiens mm -hmm. and that was the first time and the only time in 20 years that france and britain had been at peace it was a very uneasy peace but peace nonetheless when napoleon took the throne when he crowned himself emperor of europe excuse me europe yeah emperor of france <laughs> I, he wanted to be emperor of europe right and we'll get to that later on but um when he crowned himself emperor of france or emperor of the french on december 2nd 1804 is when the british formed the third coalition against napoleon that's when they went to war one of the biggest misconceptions about the napoleonic wars is that napoleon started these wars he did not he only started one of them which, well, technically two, but one of them was the invasion of Russia, okay, which he started, um, and also the um, invasion of Spain, the uh, ousting of the Spanish royal family and uh, putting his own family on the throne and trying to occupy Spain, the Spanish ulcer, which turned into a disaster. Yeah. Um, but otherwise, the Allies started these wars, and Napoleon had wanted to preserve peace, but they didn't go for it. They wanted him off the throne. Mm -hmm. And they spend, spare no expense. There's an old saying that the British spare no expense to defeat Napoleon. They were willing to defeat Napoleon right down to the last Austrian. Mm -hmm. And it's funny because what that means is, is that the British paid the armies of Europe to fight against Napoleon. They fight it because the British really didn't have a large army at the time. When yeah. have they ever in history, right? So although the British army would play a significant role in Spain later on, and once it was paired with the Duke of Wellington, it became a force to be reckoned with. But early on, it didn't perform very well. And it wasn't very large, so the British needed to pay the Austrians and the Russians to fight Napoleon. And yeah. they did numerous times, and numerous times Napoleon won. And the old joke was about the Austrians because Napoleon had to defeat the Austrians about four times in his career in four different wars. Uh, the, he, the Austrians were like his whipping boy. And it was really sad because the Austrian army was actually not that bad, but he yeah. made such cruel work of them. It, it's, it's unbelievable. Um, um, but okay. So this is an American history page. I am historically. Yes. Okay. So we've got, there, we've got to talk a little a bit about with that. Yes. We've, we've got to talk a little bit about the Louisiana purchase. Yes. Was that okay. the Louisiana purchase? Was that true that Napoleon sold it in order to finance the Napoleonic Wars? No. no. So, so why, wh how did that deal come about? Why did Napoleon okay. decide to give up such a large swath of land to the Americans? Okay. So Napoleon gave up Louisiana and sold it to the United States. I think it was for $15 million, mm -hmm. um, which is probably the greatest steal in American history. <laughs> OK, yeah. because Napoleon realized that he could not defend it against the British. The French did not have the resources. They didn't have the army to send overseas. They didn't have a large enough navy because the French Navy was really purged of all its good officers during the revolution. So while it had excellent warship, it didn't have excellent crews and excellent captains. So there's no way it can compete with the Royal Navy, especially in 1803. Yeah. So recognizing this, Napoleon, as a shrewd politician he was, said, OK, well, uh, let's sell it to the U.S. And the U.S. gets this great swath of territory mm -hmm. and he no longer has to spend any money or spare any, you know, any anxiety of defending a French colonial empire, which he originally wanted to do. That's why he had the Louisiana, Louisiana originally. He acquired they acquired it from Spain mm -hmm. and he wanted to create a North American empire. But he realized it wasn't possible because of the British 
And with the ad, the the creation of the United States, um, they would have the upper hand in any type of conflict in North America. So right. that's the truth behind a Louisiana Purchase. Uh, did he, you know, want to use the the money for the financing of the Napoleonic Wars? Uh, no, he wanted to use the money for financing, you know, whatever else was going on in France, and he right. utilized it really to finance the army just to upkeep the army um, for its coming campaign against the invasion of England, the proposed invasion of England in 1805. So, and that's where we start getting into the wars itself. Yeah. You know, but let's, let's talk about the United States again. Yeah. Okay? Because this is something that isn't really mentioned in history book. And, you know, you go through high school, you might not ever hear about this, but Napoleon and the United States had a very good relationship. Okay, Napoleon uh, and the U.S. were allied to each other. The U.S. was Napoleon's ally. And much of this was because of Anglophobia. Of course, it was right after the American Revolution. And mm-hmm. much of the American public was like, we don't want to, you know, do any, have anything to do with the British. Yeah. You know, no Francophiles. You know, French helped us and everything, you know. Well, it wasn't the same France anymore. And the U.S. government even turned around and said, you know, we don't have to pay you back. You know, because we owe the French monarchy money. We don't owe Napoleon money and the, Re- the Republic money. We owe the Bourbon monarchy money. So they said, no, we're not going to pay our debt back. But Napoleon saw them as a useful ally um, in North America because the idea was to come later. The idea was to come to fruition later on in 1812. And when we get to 1812, when you want to you know, talk about it, I'll say why. But the United States remained Napoleon's ally all the way through the Napoleonic Wars. So there is there is a connection between the two, especially yeah. with President Madison and Napoleon, personal letters that were sent back and forth. Um, when you want to talk about Russia, I'll get to that. Yeah. But there was a communique between the two of them that their own government officials didn't even know about. So there was a relationship between the U.S. and Napoleon, a very good one. Okay, well, that's good to know. That is good to know. I mean, the only th- I will say for me, you know, I'm in the founding of America. You know, I've got my podcast and we're very much in the French and Indian War right now. So I will definitely get to the, the War of 1812, which I know you are also very yes. all versed in <laughs> as well. I, we've talked a little bit about that. Was was um, that kind of relationship between uh, France and the United States a big factor in the War of 1812? Yes, it was. It was a direct factor. Yeah. I had a lot to do because of um, the U.S.'s neutrality, okay? A number of different acts were passed, such as the Act of Berlin in, in 1806, which forbade American trade, any trade, with Napoleonic France. And Britain had the means to prevent that with its large and powerful navy. So the blockade of French ports, and that drove the United States more towards France because it was hurting American commerce, Mm -hmm. because no French goods would enter American port. And as earlier during the American Revolution, uh, the American public recognized that British goods weren't exactly the best quality. And they weren't allowing Dutch products, French products, and of course you get into the impressment of American seamen, okay, Mm -hmm. on the high seas. And one of the British reasons for doing this was to, you know, crew their ships to fight against Napoleon. (laughs) Because they had a lot of mutinies in the Royal Navy during that time. And they're like, well, who are we going to get? Ah, let's get American. Because at that time, many Americans still had a British accent. Mm -hmm. So you couldn't prove you were actually an American citizen. So they would take you off the ship and say, you know what? Now you're in the Royal Navy. And as you know, that angered the American public. And that was one of the factors that led to war. Mm -hmm. Um, But Napoleon, the Napoleonic, it's a byproduct of the Napoleonic Wars, the War of 1812. The Napoleonic Mm -hmm. Wars doesn't happen. The War of 1812 probably doesn't happen either. Yeah. So it's definitely related. Yeah. um, I'm really excited to get into to that part of history. Cause I, I feel like the war of 1812 is like that little secret that we kind of yeah. mentioned a little bit. And yeah. then like, we, it just goes away, you know, it's like a I forgotten think, war. I think well, the most that people re- know about it is that the white house was burned down and that's pretty much like <laughs> yeah, it. Yeah. Right. And you know. the biggest misconception about the white house burning down is I get a lot of my Canadian friends turn around and say, Oh, Canadians burned it. No, there wasn't <laughs> one Canadian in the British force sent to burn the capital. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so cool your heels on that one. But um, yeah. And, you know, the War of 1812 is uh, called the Forgotten War alongside the Korean War. But in England, he, they don't even discuss it. It's not even mentioned. They, because they were so heavily involved in the Napoleonic Wars in Europe that it was a sideshow. 
Yeah. But here in the U.S., it was a big deal. And it established a national identity, not only for us, but for Canada. So yeah. on this side of the pond, it was important. On that side, people don't even remember it. They'll go, what war of 1812? Are you talking about in Russia with, with Napoleon? You don't even recognize it. So, but yeah. I think the war of 1812 is a bigger deal for Canada than oh, it, it is, is for America. It really is. So, yeah. and, and that's the thing is like every time I have like maybe something that kind of refers to it a little bit. There, there are Canadians that are like in the comments oh, yeah. talking about it. And I'm just like, as an American, even a, a, an American that knows quite a bit about American history, I haven't got my way up there yet. And so for <laughs> me, I'm like, I I really just don't know. Cause like, I yeah. even in college, they never taught me. No, about they, that. they don't No, You, you know, it's, it's like, unless you are going to specialize and really yeah. seek that out, even in college trying to get even in my master's program nobody's talking about the war of 1812 no, unless that's what your specific, thesis is going right, to be on so right. so yeah it is kind of interesting <laughs> well to make a long love story short Canadian... listen we love the canadians yeah i mean they, you know you've do. got a, a great, great ally if that's what you if the war of 1812 right. is going to be your thing then you have that thing <laughs> and the canadians not to get too much into it but the canadians can claim some bravado out of it because because they did participate in repulsing the American invasions of Canada. But that's where it ends. They think it went all the way down to Washington. They thought they had something to do with that. And, you know, and a lot of what gets missed in all this are the Native American nations that were caught in between the War of 1812, that mm. the, the Iroquois and the Ottawa and so many of their societies that were destroyed by this war. Um, yeah. But that's going off the beaten path a little bit from Napoleon, but <laughs> there, there is a relationship between the United States and Napoleon. And at the end of Napoleon, at the end of the battle of Waterloo, Napoleon actually tried to escape to the United States. Oh, so he did. Okay. So let's talk going. about, let's talk about how Napoleon, let's talk about his downfall a little bit. Oh, okay. Let's talk about his downfall a little bit. Um, so he becomes, you know, the emperor. He is Napoleon. The Napoleonic War is going on. When does it really start going bad for Napoleon? It really starts going bad, although it didn't come to fruition until later on when he uh, took the he gave the throne of Spain to his brother, Joseph, mm. and he got mixed up in Spanish internal affairs. Uh, there was a movement in Spain that mirrored the one in France, the Republican movement. And they believed that the Catholic Church held too much power in Spain, which it did. And it still does to this day. But they were more libertarian and they tried to support uh, King Joseph Bonaparte, who was actually a pretty good king. Not a great general, but a good king. And that was the first indication that Napoleon was going to have a problem because he kept sending men after men and men. At one point, he had over 250,000 men in Spain alone, just French. Mm. We're not talking about his auxiliaries. We're talking about Frenchmen. And um, But he went to Spain. The Spanish army was the worst army of the Napoleonic era. It was terrible. They were like cannon fodder, you know, uh, for the Duke of Wellington. They were like, take shots for us, you know, or for Napoleon. It's like, oh, but Spain had a unique way of coming up with 100,000 men. Each time it was like whack-a-mole. Napoleon's uh, marshals would eliminate one army. The next army would come up. It's their partisans, their guerrillas that really fought Napoleon's army and really gave word to the ulcer that was called Spain. So a combination of Spain, which really ramped up in 1811, but also his immediate downfall would have been 1812. Mm -hmm. And here's where we get into the Russian campaign. OK, yeah. now. I'm going to go back real quick to President Madison, okay? This is where we tie in Napoleon with Madison. Napoleon had this plan if it came to invading Russia, because the original idea was not to invade Russia. It was just to uh, you know, mass an army along the Russian-Polish border to compel Emperor Alexander, okay, to conform to the continental system, which was an economic blockade of Great Britain. Mm -hmm. As early as 1810, because it was crippling the Russian economy, Alexander I pulled his country out of the continental system because he was still Napoleon's ally, and which we didn't go through, but Alexander I and Russia was Napoleon's ally after 1807. Mm. So to try to compel him to re-enter this blockade against Great Britain, uh, the economic blockade, he amassed his army. When Alexander said no, the Russian army withdrew from the border, and Napoleon decided, well, let's go after him, 
okay? We need a decisive battle. So then it becomes a campaign. So his army moves into Russia. Mm-hmm. The Russians refuse battle. They retire. They, they fight a small rearguard action, small skirmishes here and there. But there wasn't that one decisive battle that Napoleon needed that he believed would end the war in one fell stroke. Not until the Battle of Smolensk. And he believed that the Battle of Smolensk was going to be that battle, mm-hmm. but it wasn't. The Russian army escaped again. Okay. Eventually, they ended up at the Battle of Borodino in September of uh, 1812, September 7th. The bloodiest day of the Napoleonic Wars. Over 75,000 men were killed. Not just wounded. Oh my gosh. But killed during that battle. And it was a Pyrrhic Napoleonic victory, but a lot of historians, including myself, criticize Napoleon because he refused to um, activate the Imperial Guard during the battle. And if he had, it's a possibility he could have decisively defeated the Russian army on the field that day. And broke their morale, and Alexander would have sued for peace. But instead, General K- Marshal Kutuzov, who was in charge of the Russian army, withdrew the Russian army in good order. And instead of defending the capital directly, they left the capital. Well, Napoleon and his army reached the capital, okay, in uh, uh, early Sept- late September. And uh, the Russians don't surrender. And the rest is history. The horrific withdrawal. From, from Russia, and the Grand Armée disintegrated from over 500,000 to less than 40,000 when he recrosses the Barasina River into Poland. Oh my gosh. And how do you recover from that? Right? How do you recover <laughs> from that? What a devastating loss. It really was. But you know what? Napoleon does recover from it. He develops another army. Okay, he builds another army of 250,000 men, and now he's got to stop the Russians. And Alexander I becomes like the hero now, um, the hero of continental Europe who sees Napoleon as the existential threat. They need to defeat him. Mm -hmm. And so he leads the coalition effort on the continent, whereas the British are leading the effort in Spain under the Duke of Wellington, who hasn't even entered the discussion yet, who becomes an important figure later on. Yeah, But um, Napoleon falls back, of course, to Germany. You have the Battle of Nations, the Battle of Leipzig, which the anniversary was a few days ago. Mm. Napoleon goes back to France. He fights a very skillful campaign in France in 1814. The Allies just simply overwhelm him, and he's forced to abdicate the throne. If you've seen the movie Waterloo uh, in 1970, it gives a good representation of the series of events that took place for that to happen. Yeah. So he abdicates the throne, and that's his uh, descent from power initially, where he's exiled to the island of Elba. So Napoleon's meteoric rise was a meteoric fo- a fall from power as well. So it, it occurred within a span of just two years, yeah. where he was at the pinnacle of his power, and then he's at exile. <laughs> yeah. So he had it from two different directions, from Spain and then Russia. And then what turned out not to be an invasion became an invasion that was an own undoing. Now, Mm -hmm. getting back to James Madison, I kind of veered away from that. (laughs) Napoleon discussed the invasion of Russia with Madison personally through letters for about two years because he had this planned well in advance. And he wanted to coordinate. Okay, wait a second. At this time, is John Quincy the ambassador? John Quincy was the ambassador, yes. In Russia? Okay, so well, this did not. He did not go through him. It, okay, so he was it, cut it, out of any of that. Any of it. Okay. Anything. This was, and this didn't become known until I think the 1950s, where they actually found um, in the presidential library letters from Napoleon Bonaparte to James Madison. And this was done through secret correspondence. How they achieved it is really not known so much. They only mentioned it briefly, where they, Napoleon had special envoys that posed as British uh, traders, and they would enter yeah. the U.S., and that's how he got through the Royal Navy. Um, but their correspondence, they wanted the United States to occupy the British on the North American continent and secure Napoleon's Baltic Baltic flank from the British Navy as he entered Russia. And this was coordinated almost to perfection because the invasion of Russia began only a few days before the United States declared war on Great Britain. So the timing of this was impeccable. Yeah. Despite no communication, I mean, how do you how do you you know determine that? And it was done almost to the day, and it didn't work out really for no. either side. But um, that's the link between James Madison and Napoleon that you will not see in most history books. Wow, yeah, that's really interesting. Any of them. 
So, uh, but that's how Napoleon ended up in Elba. And of course, he leaves Elba, okay? Elba wasn't a prison. A lot of people think it was a prison. It wasn't a prison. He had a personal guard of 1,000 men, might have been 1,200, plus uh, retainers, plus, you know, household staff and everything else. He was the ruler of Elba. He was the emperor of Elba at that point. And he created a road system and improved, you know, uh, personal hygiene on the island and everything. He made it relevant. Well, he saw an opportunity to leave Elba and return to France because France, once again, was experiencing political upheaval. People did not like Louis XVIII. He was a very, you know, opulent, per, you know, he was very fat and everything. And they thought yes. all he did was eat all day and didn't care about the French people. So not to say anything's wrong with that, but, you know, I mean, <laughs> it is what it is. They were very hypocritical in that time. Yeah. So they said, well, we need to carry the fat king off the throne and invite Napoleon back. Well, contrary to popular belief, where the Austerlitz campaign of 1805 was Napoleon's finest campaign, maybe 1814, this was his best campaign. Mm. Because name another time in history, a general lands in a country with a thousand men, okay? An army of 140,000 men is sent to stop him, okay? Napoleon is able to convince that army to go to his side. He captures each and every town in France, and then ends up in Paris without firing a single shot in anger. Oh, wow. That is a remarkable feat that has never been replicated in the history of the world. Now, you can yeah. point to, say, William III when he came to England during the Glorious Revolution, but that was a different situation. You know, they say, hey, Billy, you know, that was a different situation when he right. invited him. This wasn't so much the factor. At first, they're like, we don't want Napoleon back. And all of a sudden, once he lands in France, huh, it's a different story because not only are the French people enthralled by this because they feel that French honor has been trampled upon through the Congress of Vienna that was going on to redraw the map of Europe. They were saying, wait a minute, uh, here's our opportunity. Yeah. So Napoleon retakes the throne in 1815. Okay. And immediately... He sends out peace offering, okay, saying, "Listen, the crown prince uh, of of you know Prince Charles in England, and uh, you know the Prince Regent and other the other courts of Europe, like, listen, you know, I don't want to fight. I just want to live in peace." Well, they said no, and they said, "You know what? We're not going through this again. Uh, we're going to form what's called the Seventh Coalition against you, and we're going to declare war on you and say you're an international outlaw, where make it legal that anybody could just go up to you and shoot you dead." Oh, and wow. with no repercussion to that yeah. person whatsoever. So he rallies the French people who see him as Napoleon again. They're like, wow, we're going to get back to our, our winning ways and we're going to be popular and we're going to be powerful again. Well, it didn't work out that way. OK, so <laughs> the Allies put 500,000 men in the field. The first two armies to do battle with Napoleon were, of course, in present-day Belgium, uh, the Duke of Wellington's Anglo-Allied Army, and the Prussian Army under Gerhard von Blücher. Mm -hmm. And these two armies would participate in the Hundred Days Campaign, which it would become known as. Napoleon's, Napoleon would defeat, he'd really give Blücher's Prussian Army a thrashing at the Battle of Linny mm -hmm. um, on June 16th of 1815. Marshal Ney was in command of the French Army during the Battle of Quatre Bras on the same day, against the Duke of Wellington. And he actually defeated Wellington. It was really indecisive, but Wellington withdrew because the Prussians withdrew. And then, of course, they met again in the battlefield of Waterloo, which was Napoleon's final battle in which he was defeated. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of misconception about Waterloo. Um, if you want to go into that, we can. But <laughs> um, after the Battle of Waterloo is over, the war does not end. Napoleon has to flee because he's lost Paris. Um, Paris turns against him politically. So now he tries to flee to the uh, uh, Bay of Biscay, one of the ports, of the, I think Rochefort, where he's going to board a br uh, French frigate that's going to take him to America. Mm. And if he, he was very close to succeeding, so close. The Prussian cavalry was on his heels. They were chasing him. He disguised himself and crossed France. The Prussians were going to kill him, literally yeah. kill him. The British didn't want to do that. They didn't want to make him into a martyr because mm. his son was still alive. So they got wind of what was going on. And they blockaded the port and seized the French frigate and the captain. And by the time Napoleon got there, he was. they were like, listen, you need to surrender. We will prevent you from being captured by the Prussians who want to kill you. 
Yeah. So Napoleon said, okay, I'm done. And he boarded the British vessel and he was exiled to St. Helena, where he lived out the rest of his life until he died in 1821. Yeah. Um, but um, a couple of facts about Napoleon, uh, interesting fact about Napoleon was his horse, Marengo. Napoleon had about 50 horses that he kept yeah. in his personal, personal stables. Traveled with him everywhere across Europe. But his one horse, his one favorite horse was Marengo. He's the white stallion you see in the, the painting by Jacques Louis David of Napoleon crossing the Alps. The only difference is he wasn't riding his horse when he crossed the Alps. He was riding a mule. But mm. that's different. That's that's all <laughs> the propaganda we get into. But yeah. his horse Marengo was wounded 48 times throughout the course of the Napoleonic Wars. Wow. And he was captured after the Battle of Waterloo. It became the property of a British officer and brought back to England. And he was given royal honors and he was given a proper burial as Napoleon's horse. So there's a so lot of different Napoleon's stories. Napoleon's horse is buried in England. Yes. There's a lot of stories, like stories that surround Napoleon, which are very interesting that aren't really discussed very much. I mean, yeah. for example, Napoleon being defeated by 30,000, like 3,000, 30,000 rabbits, I think it was. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, that's a real story, you know. Well, I, you know what? Can you tell? So, okay. So I was talking to JD from History, um, yes. History Underground. Yeah. And we were talking about the movie and I mentioned, well, you know, he was defeated by some rabbits. And yeah. JD like looked at me like I was nuts. No, it's true. Like, no, he was. I'll tell you how it happened yeah, real so quick. Tell, I, I couldn't short. explain okay. the specifics of so it. So yeah. after, after the Treaty of Tilsit in 1807, which was between Russia and France, that ended the War of the Fourth Coalition, where Prussia got screwed and Russia and France became allies. Yeah. Well, Alexander I and Napoleon became friends. So as a measure of good faith, they organized a bunny hunt. Okay. Yeah. So Napoleon's chief of staff, Marshal Berthier, had to go around and collect 30,000 bunnies from Germany. Why so many bunnies? I don't know. That, that part, I would be <laughs> honest with you, I don't know why 30,000 bunnies. Um, so these bunnies were let loose, okay, in the countryside. Now, mind you, you have Napoleon his generals, his entourage. You have the Russians that are there, okay? Yes. Your new allies. So they start chasing the bunny. The only problem was about 3,000 of these bunnies that were in the immediate area weren't afraid of the hunters. And Napoleon was leading the charge. And they actually turned around and started chasing them. And Napoleon, it got so bad and Napoleon turned around and said, you know what, guys, in so many words, we lost this one. We're leaving. <laughs> and the rabbits defeated Napoleon. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's a really cool story, you know. <laughs> and, of course, everyone was laughing at it. You know, yeah. the, the, the Russian generals were laughing at it. Napoleon's generals were laughing at it. Like, <laughs> you, you just got defeated by a bunch of rabbits. So that that actually is true. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. So Napoleon, I think now they've kind of um, have figured it out that he had died from. I think now they're they're saying for sure it was stomach cancer. Yes. But there's always been this kind of conspiracy theory that he was poisoned. Yes. You kind of know where that conspiracy came from. Is and was I mean was he poisoned? I mean, do you think that was a real possibility i believe it was a real possibility um and part of the reason why and part of the reason was because of his son napoleon ii who was growing up in the austrian court mm. and they did not want to see a bonapartist try to reclaim his father's throne so when napoleon was on saint helena there was there was a lot of napoleonic interest in his life so much so too close for comfort for the british Mm -hmm. So there is a thought that the British had him poisoned. And the governor on the island of St. Helena, a, uh, a British general named Darrow Wimple, uh, was not, didn't treat Napoleon very well. Mm -hmm. And it's a rumor that he had him poisoned. Now, Napoleon had suffered from stomach cancer for, for a few years. Mm -hmm. And he had gastro problems, which really played a part in the Battle of Waterloo. It really bothered him on the Russian campaign. He could not ride a horse for any great length of time. He gained a lot of weight in the process. So much, He was embarrassed of it so much so that during the first days of the invasion of Russia, he stayed in his tent because he was afraid of his men making fun of him. So mm -hmm. he had a lot of uh, physical issues. Um, so my personal opinion after researching all these years is that I do believe he was poisoned by the British. And I believe his son was also poisoned 
and executed as well. Even though his son died of pneumonia and fever, um, I believe he was murdered as well. So there is a link between the two. Yeah. Because his son, who became a general in the Austrian army, was demonstrating a lot of the military prowess that his father had demonstrated. Yeah. Where this guy, you know, we're a little wary of him because, you know, he's got a following in France. And, you know, if he wants to, he can go back there and try to reclaim his father's title. Yeah. So that wasn't going to happen. And somebody somewhere, uh, I think, killed him as well. And there is a general consensus among the Napoleonic historians that both of them were murdered. Interesting. That's really interesting. Um, man, Eddie, this has been so much fun. Like, I have loved just listening to you talk. I, you are <laughs> one you. of my favorite historians. You were like, you have a rare trait. I don't want to say a rare trait, but a, a trait that I definitely envy that you can memorize. I am a historian, but I don't yes, memorize are. dates. <laughs> okay. Like, I'm like, oh, I know it was like June of like 17. Yeah, yeah. But you're like, man, like you are like, oh, no, he died on this day. Yeah. Like, I, you know, you memorize dates yep. really well. And thank you. Popular to, you know, contrary to popular belief, not all historians. No, they have don't. Every date and, you know, memorized. No. We have years memorized, yep. you know, but we don't really have it Specific down to days. the day. Specific dates yeah. are hard. And yeah. funny you mention that because I was with my wife. We were looking at an apartment earlier <laughs> and we were in a complex. And I said, wait a minute. The uh, property manager was there. And I'm like, hey, listen, I fought a couple of fires in this complex years ago. And my wife was like, you did? Well, what year? I said, it was April 19th of 1994. <clears throat> She's like, yeah. how do you remember that? <laughs> well, I'm a historian. I remember dates. Yeah. So, yeah, but <laughs> I, I have an ability to do that. I mean, I've read my, I read my first book on Napoleon in the second grade, as I told uh, Sarah from uh, Sarah the History Chick. Yeah. And also yourself. I think I told Jen the same thing. I read The Campaigns of Napoleon by David Chandler when I was in the second grade. It is a few thousand pages. My uh, student, my, my teacher at the time gave me a homework assignment. She's like, do a book report on whoever you want. And I said, well, can I choose a historical figure? She said, yeah. And I loved the George Washington. But mm -hmm. I went to the school library and this big, thick book stuck out of the shelf. And I asked the librarian, can I have this book? And she said, I don't think you're going to be able to read this. This is eighth grade level. Yeah. And I said, well, let me try. So it took me a long time, but I read it cover to cover. And while I couldn't understand a lot of what was written, I eventually read it again later on. And I would recommend that book to anybody. It is the most comprehensive study of Napoleon's military campaigns. It's called The Campaigns of Napoleon by British historian David Chandler. And, and you read it in the second grade. Oh, yeah, grade. The second grade. I was all <laughs> over that. I have probably read at least a couple of hundred books on Napoleon and in the Napoleon. Yeah. Wars. And while, you know, every historian, you can't remember everything. That's right. kind of like the misconception about historians and historical enthusiasts. Like people expect us to know everything, every fine detail. We don't. That's right. why we take notes and everything. You know, That's we, why make... we do extensive research. Right. You know? exactly. like, and we know how to do research. That's a trait that yeah. not a lot of people know. They don't no. know how to do research. No. And even just a quick Google search. I mean. Yep. The rabbit hole know, search. Yeah. That's it. You can find anything you want on Google. Let me I've gone down that. some rabbit holes. You can I'll find tell you. Well, yeah. I'll tell you. Real, real, I, I mentioned that earlier. Uh, Napoleon's first fiance, Desiree Clarine. OK, yeah. well, Desiree Clary made out pretty good. I'll tell you what happened to her. She ended up meeting and falling in love with one of Napoleon's marshals, Marshal Bernadeau, um, who was uh, who did some really good things during the war in 1806 against the Prussians. The Swedish were involved in this war and he captured the port, uh, the, the city of Stralsund which was on the Baltic coast. And Bernadeau was very kind to the Swedish commander and let them go home. And Napoleon really didn't agree with this, mm -hmm. but it impressed the, uh, the, the, excuse me, the Swedish government so much because Gustav III was the king. He didn't have any heir. So they said, you know what? We're going to invite Marshal Bernadeau to become the crown prince of Sweden. They voted on him. Wow. Because they felt by having a French marshal, he would lead their army. And Napoleon agreed to it because he felt that Bernadeau would be a good fit for Sweden as an ally. Yeah. But it didn't turn out that way. Sweden joined the coalition and so did Marshal Bernadeau. And Desiree Clary married him. And she mm. became the queen of Sweden. 
Oh, and wow. her offspring is still on the throne today. Oh, so wow. she man out pretty good. Even yeah. though she did marry Napoleon, she's still, her legacy carries on through the Swedish royal family. So, you know, yeah. I'm glad that she had a happy ending because when you she kind did. of like alluded to her, I was like, yes. oh man, is she going to be like the, you know, Josephine, just like no, depressed, no. brokenhearted. She you made know. out better. She made <laughs> out better. And she actually met Napoleon one other time um, in their life when he was meeting with uh, his Marshal Bernadotte. He was actually one of his friends and um, he approved their marriage because mm -hmm. So to marry in Napoleon's uh, court, you had to get the emperor's permission. And because Bernadotte was a nobleman and he was a marshal, he had to get Napoleon's permission. And it was a very awkward meeting where Napoleon yeah. was in the same room as her current suitor and her ex-fiance. And he ended up spending some time explaining to her why they broke up and all things were forgiven. And yeah. it was assumed that they were going to be an ally, but it turned out they weren't. And Sweden actively participated in bringing down Napoleon mm. in a limited role in 1814 and 15 and, and 13. Um, but yeah, that's the story of Desiree Clary. Uh, <laughs> but we could do thousands of stories. I know, like I know. and we're we're <laughs> like we're well over the hour too. I know, I, I know. I wanted. To I think we did that last time too. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Um, but before we sign off here, tell everyone where to find you, where they where they can follow you again. Great. Just give people that reminder. I will have your links yes. down in the description Thank you. box below as well. I appreciate uh, hopefully, that. Hopefully, we can get you over to. Uh, you too? Yeah, I'm going to work on it. Matter of fact, I'm going to work on it after the video. Okay, good, <laughs> good. So try, you know, you've got a little time before I post yes. this. So if it's in there, well, I'm going to put that right down there. I would like to really get the 200,000 followers. I keep getting the 199. I keep getting the 198. And then I have a problem because of a few videos. And then I lose, you know, engagement and everything. So I'm History Unlimited on Instagram. You could find me at History Unlimited. I also have an alternate account, the Vietnam War 3.0, which is specific to the Vietnam War era. Mm -hmm. If you're into that type of history, which I am as well. Um, I'm also on TikTok, also History Unlimited. Um, I'm on, um, I used to be on Twitter, no longer. I am on Threads as History Unlimited. You can find me there where I post uh, snippets of this day in history, some smaller little videos and small little pictures. Um, but that's where you can find me. And hopefully, like you said, Lisa, on YouTube very soon, I'm going to give it a shot and see what happens. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm thinking about doing some long form content on it. So maybe that'll help stimulate the algorithm. Yeah. But um, yeah, I mean, you do a great job with it. You, you were, you know, your type of um, content is ideal for what you're using it for on the platform you're using them on, mm -hmm. you know, YouTube and everything. And, you know, you're very intelligent. You're a very good historian. You amaze me sometimes at the information you do know about American history. I'm, I'm like, how, how do I not know that? I'm like, did I, <laughs> did I know that at one time and forget, you know, I'm like, yeah. she's really good. So um Thank you. But yes, that, that means a lot coming good. from you, Eddie. That really does mean a lot. You're, so you're very welcome. You're it. you're one of my favorite creators. And if if how I how you can tell if I like a creator is if you get invites from me for collaborations, that means you're my friend. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, you're not going to get an invite from me. Yeah, so I get people all the time asking me, "Can I collab with you? Can I?" Get? Well, no, because you're posting about you know Nazi Germany. So no, I'm not going to do that. Okay, <laughs> but when it's American history, because of my love of American history. History, you are you are my American history person. So I go to you, and of course Garrett, uh, today in history buff. Uh, I mm -hmm. give a shout out to him as well. Another um, great friend of ours. Another great friend of ours. Um, Sarah, the history chick, nineteen forty one. Another good friend of ours. That's great, yeah. She's my World War II in the Pacific uh, girl. Um, I have uh, people for World War II in Europe. I've got Hidden History Pod, who I like to use a lot of my ancient history for. He loves doing that. You could follow mm -hmm. him. But me, History Unlimited, and History Unlimited 2.0, I would sincerely appreciate your follow and your support. Um, hopefully, we can, is, hopefully we can get you up to 200,000 uh, yeah. on Instagram. I really want to. I know at, that's at kind of a wall you've hit. Like, it oh, is. It's so close. It it's so close, but so far, like <laughs> I got to a hundred thousand so fast last year. I started in September. I got to a hundred thousand on Christmas and from Christmas until now, I'm almost there. And I just can't <laughs> seem to get over that hump. And I'm like, what do I got to do? You know, yeah, it's like, yeah. so hopefully we will. <laughs> okay. Well, 
everyone go give Eddie a follow at History Thank Unlimited. You. We're going to try to get him over here on YouTube. Thank yeah. you so much, Eddie, for talking Napoleon, for sharing. You know, we did bring it back a little to American history. That's so, okay. You know, that was a great <laughs> insight. Um, but thank you guys. Make sure you subscribe to the channel. Give thank this video all. a thumbs up. All that good stuff. I will see you guys next time. Have a nice night, everyone. Thank you and have a good night, everybody. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.